Today in our studio, as we're going to follow the lectures of the hour, we have several guests with us, and some of whom are young people. And I wonder if these kids have ever heard their parents give a particular answer to their questions. When you ask your dad, Dad, why can't I go to the movie tonight? Or, Dad, why can't I drive the car? Has your father ever said to you in the answer, because? You ever heard that? Yeah, you bet you have. We've all heard it. Sometimes, uh, you know, I have my grandchildren, and they're bugging me with all kinds of questions, and I try to be patient and explain them, and sooner or later I run out of patience, and they say, well, why can't we do that? I just say, just because, and I leave it at that. But that word seems such an innocent word, and yet it's a word that we use every day in our normal conversation. What does it mean? When we say that something happens because, we're assuming that there is a reason that it happens, or more specifically, that there is a cause that brings it to pass. Now, in the history of philosophy, the person most famous for giving a critical analysis of this whole idea of cause is the Scottish philosopher David Hume. Hume lived in the 18th century. He was born in 1711, died in 1776. I think many of you are familiar with the significance of that date in American history. But David Hume is considered by theologians to be one of the most formidable critics of Christianity that the church has ever had to encounter. And Hume wrote several books, but the two books that are most important, particularly for our concerns in this course, are his Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding and his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. Because in the inquiry, he gives a comprehensive critique of causality. And in his dialogue, he gives a comprehensive critique of miracles. Nobody's name is more associated with a repudiation of the idea of miracle than David Hume. But again, his major claim to fame in the history of philosophy comes as a result of his critical analysis of the concept of cause, or of causality. He was skeptical with respect to our ability to know truth, because he realized that all empirical knowledge was based upon sensations or impressions. And one of the questions he probed was this. I open my eyes, and I see the world around me, and I see all kinds of, of, of descriptive things in my eyes. I see a group of people in front of me here, some that are very young, some that are not so very young. I'm not going to use the bad word there. And we have, uh, we have a red shirt back here, a green shirt up here, a teal shirt over here, and so I have a mass of colors. And in the process of all of this, I am engaged in the act of individuation. Individuation. Now, maybe you've never heard the term individuation, but you've certainly heard the term individual. When we say that some person is an individual, we mean simply that there's one of them, <laughs> that you're not a split personality, that you're not two people, but you're one person. You're a single, particular individual. Now, when we individuate things, that means that we have the ability uh, 
even though there is a group of people here, I recognize that that group is made up of a plurality of individuals. And then I look at an individual and I can individuate certain parts of that person, the head, the arms, the torso, the legs, the feet, and so on. Now the Hume asked the question, how is it that our senses are being bombarded by all of these external stimulations or impressions? How are we able to sort this out? How can we pick out a particular individual in the midst of a crowd? Why don't all of these sensations just get all mixed up in a chaotic blurb of sense impression? Well, he's saying that this is one of the, the great problems of philosophy, is how can this external force give rise to concrete intelligible ideas. He also raised the question of how these sensations that we have, these experience of seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, and so on, how do they relate to thoughts or ideas? And of the two, that is ideas and sensations, which of those two is more lively? and powerful? Well, for Hume, he would say the sensation. And these sensations that give rise to thoughts, we have the ability to remember. And he also probed the mystery of memory, which is something, again, that we take for granted until we see somebody who suffers from Alzheimer's or some advanced forms of hardening of the arteries where they begin to lose their capacity for memory. I deal with this all the time as a teacher with my students, where I give them final exams at the end of the term, and they don't always remember <laughs> what they were supposed to remember on the test. In fact, just the other night, uh, for the church in which I serve, I serve on the committee that examines candidates for the ministry. And I, it's my job to examine their theology. And they produce papers where they give a summary of what they believe and so on. And I had this young man before me the other night, and I read his doctrinal statement, and I circled five or six things on it that gave me questions about the, what this fellow believed. And, and I began to interrogate him on a few of these things, and it was obvious to me that he was a little bit confused about some of these ideas. And finally, I looked at him and I said, where did you learn your systematic theology? Who taught you systematic theology? You know what he said? R.C. Sproul. <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, I had you 15 years ago in this seminary, and frankly, I had forgotten that he was ever one of my students, and so now I didn't know whether his uh, lack of precision on this particular element was because the student didn't learn or because the teacher didn't teach. <laughs> so I had to help him along with it. But there's always the problem of memory. He did not keep in his mind the things that I had taught him, nor did I keep in my mind a good memory of him. So we were both having a problem with memory lapses. Every single moment of every single day, you are being bombarded with sensations and impressions. You're seeing things perhaps you've never seen before, and yet your mind has to record all of that data. I've said before, you can make a decision to this afternoon to stop studying, but you cannot make a decision to stop learning. Because as long as you're awake, as long as you're conscious, as long as you're conscious, you're learning. Even if you don't want to be learning, you are receiving information. You're receiving sensations and data. And that data is being stored in your brain. But you don't remember it all, do you? I have a hard time remembering what I did yesterday. 
Well, one of the things, one of the, the critical insights that Hume had was how memory works. And he said that memory is inseparably related to the original sensations that you had dependent upon their liveliness or what he called their intensity and their vivacity. Now, we have a little girl who's with us today uh, who I believe is 11 years old, 9 years old, 9 years old, and her name is Grace. Is that right? Did I get the age right, Grace? How old are you? Eight. Eight years old. I could have sworn you were nine. You see how good my memory is? You told me just a few moments ago that you were eight, and already I have you a year older than you were. Right, Stephen? Whoop! <laughs> what happened there? Can you throw that back to me? Because I can't work without my eraser. And I missed it. Now, you know what I think? I think... Grace, that when you go back home to Alexandria, Virginia, you're not going to remember a whole lot about what I'm teaching today about David Hume. But you know what I bet you will remember, and you may even tell your girlfriends when you get home. So I went to her, this crazy professor down in Orlando, and in the middle of his lecture, right there on TV, he threw his eraser at me. Do you think you'll remember that? Yeah, you'll remember that if you don't remember anything else. Because that experience would be more intense and more vivid than the experience of listening to abstract ideas. Incidentally, Jonathan Edwards, who was preaching in the 18th century and was the uh, chief uh, uh, spokesman for the Great Awakening in the United States, is famous for his sermons. His, his most famous sermon, of course, is Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And people, you know, f are aghast when they read that sermon, when he talks about sinners being in such a precarious situation that they're like a spider hanging over this fire, and they're just being suspended by a single tiny sliver of thread. And these flames are beating and thrashing about it. And if just one flame touches that little single spider web thread, what will happen to the spider? He'll fall into the fire. And he's telling the people of Northampton, or, or, or of uh, where he gave that particular sermon, which wasn't Northampton, he says, you are like that spider. You're hanging over the pit of hell by a slender thread with the flames of divine rash beating and thrashing about it, ready to burn it and singe it in any moment. And the only thing that keeps you from falling into the fire is what? The hand of God. The grace of God. All right? Now, people don't usually preach like that today. He also borrowed some images from the Bible where he said, God's bow is bent and his arrow is aimed at your heart. Now that's vivid, isn't it? I mean, you think about God as an archer with his bow bent and, the, and his arm is quivering, and you know that arrow is going to come flying out of that string any second. Now, Jonathan Edwards wasn't just a preacher, he was a philosopher. And he was acutely aware of what was going on in Great Britain in terms of this study of sensations. And he made it his practice to preach in such a way as to use very graphic, concrete images. Images that would be unforgettable. Images that people would remember Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Because he understood how the mind actually works. Well. In his analysis of all of these things, Hume then turned his attention
to the critical question of causality. Because we do have an impression of causality. The rain falls down and the grass gets wet. Why does the grass get wet? Because it's raining. See? The grass gets wet because it's raining. What could be more simple than that, right? Well, Hume would look at that and say, yes, every time I see the rain fall, immediately after the rain falls, I find that the grass is wet. And so I assume that the reason why the grass is wet is because the rain fell on it. And we say, well, of course that's what you assume. Doesn't everybody assume that? And, and Hume would agree, yes, we all assume that. But he said, how do you know that the reason why the grass is wet is because it rained? How do you know that because one thing follows another, that that which follows was caused by the first thing. It's like asking the farmer what it is that makes the sun rise every morning. And the farmer says, oh, I know what causes the sun to come up every day. And he says, what? He says, my rooster. <laughs> he says, because every morning my rooster crows at the crack of dawn, and as soon as my rooster crows, the sun comes up. Now, obviously, he had a regular experience of two things that happened in sequence, one thing that followed after the other. And he made the assumption, right, that the second thing was caused by the first thing, and thereby committing one of the oldest and most common logical fallacies there happens to be, and that's the fallacy that's called the post hoc fallacy that says, after this, therefore, because of this. Well, we don't believe that the sun comes up because the rooster crows. But there is an ordinary relationship between the rain coming down and the grass getting wet. Or we could call that an ordinary connection. The question Hume was asking was, is that ordinary connection a necessary connection? That is there an unyielding, absolute, necessary connection between the rains falling and the grass getting wet? Now again, here's where when you ask a question like this, some people rise up and protest and say, if that's what the study of philosophy is about, I'm getting off of this bus because this is crazy. I mean, obviously, it's the rain that is falling that is causing the grass to go wet. Well, it wasn't obvious to the occasionalists of the 17th century, was it? It wasn't obvious to Leibniz with his theory of pre-established harmony. What these earlier thinkers had said was, how do we know that the real cause of the grass is getting wet is not the direct and immediate work of God? God makes it rain, and then his customary way of governing his universe is he causes the grass to get wet every time after it rains. But it's not the rain that makes the grass wet, it's God that makes the grass wet. Do you remember our struggle over the concepts of primary and secondary causality? See, Remember the occasionalist, Malebranche, for example, who said, the grass is getting wet, or the rain falling is merely the occasion for God to step into the gap and make the grass wet. But can you see God stepping in? God's a spirit. He's invisible. So how would we know whether it's God that's making the grass wet or the rain that's making the grass wet? Now, again, that may seem like a silly question, 
at the beginning. But when we are concerned with the whole broad scope of how this universe operates, and we recognize what people were beginning to understand in the 18th century, that there's a whole lot more going on out there than meets the eye. And how did we know that? Again, through the invention of the telescope. And we began to see things that were happening that without the telescope, we couldn't even imagine were actually going place, going or taking place. And so what the skeptic is saying at this point is, who knows what's really going on out there? Who knows what is really causing one thing to happen in a successive connection to another? Now, in his skepticism, Hume, and we'll explore this more fully in our next uh, lesson, but Hume said, we have to make a distinction between a customary relationship and a causal relationship. And for Hume, they are not necessarily the same thing. That's what I've been trying to explain for the last few minutes. It is a custom of our experience to see grass getting wet after it rains. We therefore assume that there is a necessary connection between the rains falling and the grass is getting wet. But those are not the same thing. And so what Hume is going to do is explain to us the mystery of causal relationships from a different perspective that raises questions about the reality of causality itself. Now, what's the significance of that, particularly for Christianity? When I say, why do you believe in Jesus? You may say to me, because God raised him from the dead. Do we know that God caused? Did anybody witness God's action there? No. In fact, that raises the question of miracles. Can we believe miracles at all? Why do you believe that there is a God? And you say, well, I look at the world around me. Somebody had to cause it. Much of the arguments for the existence of God historically have been based on reasoning from the need for a cause. And not just for the, argue, for the existence of God, but to remember Descartes, Famous formula, I think, therefore I am, and I asked the question at that time, what was Descartes assuming when he says, I think, therefore I am? He was assuming that if he's thinking, if, if, if he is doubting, there must be a cause of that doubt. There must be a doubter. And for there to be a doubter, there must be a cause of there being a doubter. There must be a thinker. And for there to have to have thought, there has to be a thinker, and for a thinker to be, for a thinker to think, he has to be. He's assuming causality all the way through that argument. Well, causality is an assumption that every philosopher ever lived has, uh, has used. And now, for the first time, it's coming under rigorous attack by David Hume's analysis, which raises serious problems for biblical Christianity and for science.